All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Alan, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to get up on this final morning of the uh, ISMRM here. <clears throat> um, so I think we have a very nice title for the, section, the session and the talk here. It's kind of, so we'll start off with lung MRI. Um, and I have to disclose a uh, consulting arrangement with uh, human longevity. Um, so here's the outline of what I'll go through uh, in the next uh, half hour this or so this morning. Um, and that's going to be, first of all, just some questions about well, why you know, we want to do lung MRI. It's actually not a common use of MRI. Uh, go through some of the challenges, so why isn't lung MRI used more? Um, and then go through the imaging methods that we have available. Um, and I generally group these into two classes, which are sort of proton-based methods and then inhaled gases of, uh, of some sort, which there are a number. Um, if you'd like to follow along with the slides, uh, you can find them uh, by Googling uh, or going that, to that link right there. Um, so this is just my very brief um, context of where does MRI fit in pulmonary imaging. Uh, so of course we have uh, projection x-ray, of course very fast, very widespread, um, but the main advantage being, disadvantage, excuse me, being it's just a 2D projection. So of course when we're going to look at lung MRI, we're going to want to you know, have uh, the advantage of 3D and also look at applications where maybe that volumetric coverage would be important. Um, and then really the standard for pulmonary imaging is CT. Um, of course it has the advantages of CT of speed, resolution, um, and you know, this is really the standard of care for, for most pulmonary imaging is, is going to be CT. Um, uh, one of the major drawbacks of CT, as we know, is uh, the substantial ionizing radiation. So if you have somebody who's going to need a lot of repeated examinations, um, or especially worried about this in the pediatric populations. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think uh, there's sort of a limited range of information to the hurricane. We're getting this ex exquisite structural information, um, but in terms of if we want to get more functional information, this is an area where MRI may be able to step in and make a difference. And, um, but there are a number of reasons why uh, MRI is not a major modality here. Um, it's slow, you know, as you know, it takes tens of seconds to minutes. Uh, we never quite get the spatial resolution as good as CT. Um, and, you know, frankly, I'm not sure we should even try. Uh, uh, it's hard to match. Um, and then with this longer scan time, we're going to have to deal a lot more with motion artifacts, through respiration, cardiac motion. Um, breast hold scanning is sort of the norm for, for a lot of imaging, but that's pretty hard for some of these respiratory uh, patients and kids, of course. Um, and then we have a couple uh, you know, physical limitations. The lung tissue itself actually has a relatively low proton density, um, which uh, obviously is problematic for reasons of SNR if we want to actually observe the lung parenchyma itself. And then the susceptibility differences between uh, lung and uh, air, or the lung tissue and air give us these short T2 star values, which make imaging hard. Um, this is just another uh, way of uh, showing some of that with this uh, nice drawing of, of the lung, you know, the motion we've got, uh, low proton density, as we'll see in a bunch of images I'll show, um, and then this structure of uh, alveolar structure where we have the lung tissue maybe we want to image, but filled with, uh, uh, hopefully, with uh, uh, gas. So um, why should we bother? Uh, and I think some of the reasons we should is well, we do want to eliminate ionizing radiation, especially in radio-sensitive populations. Um, and then we want to, I think we can provide more information in terms of other image contrasts or functional information, potentially. Um, that we can offer to our clinicians. Um, and, you know, so if we take these advantages, then you can think of doing either uh, more frequent uh, imaging studies. Um, you can 
add uh, uh, imaging into uh, more longitudinal or research studies in populations where it might be hard to justify uh, the radiation exposure of CT or things like you know more mild asthma, um, where we might want to study uh, lung function in, in these diseases. And I think there's you know if we can do this well, it's going to open up a huge array of, of applications. So, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to divide these into the two classes of imaging methods. I'll start off talking about uh, proton-based imaging methods and then move on to talk about the inhaled gas methods. Um, and so the proton methods are really going to be faced with these challenges I mentioned of uh, motion and short T2 star. And the inhaled gases, we have these class of, of methods we'll go through. Uh, Oxygen-enhanced MRI, where we uh, have subjects breathe 100% oxygen. Uh, hyperpolarized helium gases, hyperpolar, which is now kind of uncommon, hyperpolarized xenon, which is gaining momentum, as well as uh, fluorine, uh, inert fluorinated gases, which are not hyperpolarized. Um, so most of proton-based imaging is, uh, or a large chunk of it is done with ultra-short echo time or zero echo time, UTE or ZTE methods. Uh, for this talk, I'm going to uh, focus mostly on the, the use of UTE methods, but a lot of these principles apply to ZTE as well. Um, and just as a, a brief overview, you know, we're going to go somehow go to a situation we're using specialized RF pulses, uh, usually center out type or close to center out uh, readout gradients, and then the associated reconstructions to capture the rapid signal decay, um, and actually a uh, joint benefit of going to these type of pulse sequences <clears throat> is that, um, as I'll show, is they're actually relatively robust and actually have some inherent motion information in them. It's going to be very valuable. So um, one of the, uh, if you look through the literature, one of the most common approaches is uh, a sequence coming from uh, Madison uh, developed by uh, Kevin Johnson in this uh, now pretty well cited reference here from a few years ago, uh, what I'm going to call the UWUTE. And uh, this has some specific optimizations here. <coughs> um, this sort of variable density readout. You can see in the gradients here at the top, this improves the SNR. Um, doing actually slab excitations or taking maybe a teeny tiny hit in the echo time, which is actually OK for pulmonary. Um, this makes uh, Im reduces imaging artifacts. Um, and then <clears throat> it has a number of options for, for motion correction. You can do some sort of adaptive gating type approaches, which you do with the respiratory bellows belt. Um, but if you want to do data-driven motion correction, uh, then you're going to use the last two points here to some sort of, and what's shown in this animation is really doing a pseudo-random or uh, type ordering of the acquisition strategy, so we can go back and, and resort the data in any way that we like, um, and then use this repeated center of case based information for this motion uh, estimation. And uh, some examples of the use of that uh, here's a few examples in the uh, case of detection of uh, pulmonary nodules uh, in comparison with CT. Um, and this is one you know, area where um, you know, MRI is already uh, making some, some inroads here as to, uh, uh, and these examples are actually related to our next talk, we're from a PET MRI system where for oncology studies you want to be monitoring and detecting uh, pulmonary nodules uh, for screening. Um, and if you look at uh, conventional sequences just really tend to struggle in these areas because of the motion issues and then short T2 star issues. And so these results were using this uh, bellows-based, but an adaptive bellows-based gaining approach. And visualizing nodules down to you know, maybe five millimeters or even a little bit less has been shown. Um, and uh, going through a couple more imaging examples here, uh, here's some really, I think, really amazing results coming from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, where they have this dedicated uh, neonatal it's a repurposed uh, knee scanner now as a neonatal MRI system right next to their NICU. They use this, uh, as you can see, the same pulse sequence, this UWUTE, um, and then a, a slightly improved self-navigation strategy here, so not using the bellows belt, using some 
the uh, center of case space information here to estimate and discard periods of, of bulk motion, you know, and then getting uh, sub millimeter isotropic resolution uh, in in these neonates who have uh, you know, a bunch of different uh, lung pathologies. Uh, and some examples from the, the group at Stanford um, using a, a slightly different uh, pulse sequence, but really shares a lot of the benefits of the uh, 3D radial is a, it's a 3D cones uh, acquisition. There's some fat suppression, as you can see on these, <clears throat> um, and you can see quite nice um, motion artifact free, pretty good quality images detecting a bunch of these pulmonary nodules and some of their uh, pediatric subjects uh, there. Um, I should say these were, were under uh, children's who were under sedation as well. And so um, just stepping back a second here, if we compare you know, what you would get if you set up your uh, single shot uh, fast spin echo or equivalent or gradient echo sequences, um, these would be pretty typical results uh, compared to a UTE. So of course with something like a uh, fast spin echo, you can see the, the lung signal here is is gone. I mean, we're not capturing that at, at, at uh, the echo, you know, at a spin echo times. Um, and uh, you do, it, it's hard to get some better depiction of the pulmonary vasculature. Here, motion is frozen because it's a single shot uh, fast spin echo and this uh, five year old scan. Then, if you go to something like a gradient echo scan uh, that's taking a little bit more time, even when this is under sedation, we see a bit of uh, motion artifact. Uh, coming from the, the chest wall here. Um, and maybe we're getting a little bit better depiction of at least you can see some of the pulmonary vascular structure as, a, as an indication of or actually resolving um, structure within the lung. Um, and then here going to this uh, UTE approach, <clears throat> you know, then, uh, and these are some results from, from uh, my institution and, and we're getting pretty pretty consistently and pretty nice uh, results of, of uh, depicting again, the fine structure in the pulmonary vasculature here. Um, and this is, this is very typical for our experiences that uh, really getting this structural, um, fine structural information is, is uh, doing the best job with UTE sequences in this case. Um, and just I should say, um, you know, you do have some options within both UTE pulse sequence trajectories uh, as well as a ZTE, uh, particularly in, in UTE. I've already shown examples of both the radial but as well as uh, cones type or twisted projection uh, imaging type pulse sequences. Uh, there's some uh, nice recent work uh, coming from uh, Jim Pipe and Ryan Robeson uh, using this uh, floret. It's kind of a cool trajectory for uh, those of you who are into that. Um, and you can also get quite good at imaging results even with a stack of spirals or stack of stars type pulse sequences traje uh, trajectories, but where you are doing these in a center out uh, fashion. Here. Um, so uh, the challenge of, of motion is, is not to be underestimated with these types of acquisitions here. And to get the high quality, high SNR images that I've shown, these are not capable within a single breath hold so far. Um, and uh, you know, in many people's experience, we can go through and attach the uh, respiratory bellows belt. You can do some gating based on that. And let's say, oh, maybe 70% of the time, you get the image on the bottom here. Subjects able to breathe more or less consistently enough. The, your gating works okay, um, but in a good sizable chunk of these subjects, particularly in pediatrics, um, and particularly people with compromised pulmonary function, you're gonna get a result, and this is exactly the same pulse sequence, exactly the same reconstruction approach, uh, just not handling motion as well, uh, but the result on the top here, is you get images like this. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, this is going to be not usable, right? Um, but you know that this type of information is in there. Okay? So the trick is really how can we take the data that we've got, which, which we know contains this high resolution information, and how can we manage the motion in this case? And so there are a number of, of strategies that go beyond 
using just the respiratory bellows. Um, and the advantage of the UT or ZT type strategies is you have this repeated acquisition of the center of case space. So you can either use, use that in a couple of different ways, either just taking you know, center samples is kind of the easiest first step, or you can expand, take a, a small uh, central region of, of case space um, and use this for some, some motion estimation. And then you can feed that into your reconstruction to really get rid of uh, uh, motion artifacts, so either through sort of a hard gating type approach or soft gating approaches or even extra dimensional you know, motion resolve type reconstructions and, and potentially beyond. <clears throat> so um, uh, some of the work that, uh, that uh, we had done in this space in collaboration with uh, uh, Mickey Lustig and Kevin Johnson, um, their groups was to try to, uh, was to extract the center of case space information more broadly, so not just the center point, which is, is uh, sort of the, the easiest, and, and that does help quite a bit, and this is going to help even more. Um, the trick here being, how can you uh, start to encounter pretty high undersampling factors when you're just trying to pull out the central case space data? Um, and uh, a solution to that is to use something like a local low rank uh, constraint or uh, other types of actually low rank constraints are quite good. And so this is a type of uh, image we can get from this. And this is, I should note, you can see there's an irregular breathing pattern happening in this movie here. And that's because we're capturing uh, the dynamics throughout the scan. This is not um, binned in any sort of way except to you know, take uh, about a few hundred microsecond or not micro milliseconds worth of uh, data and kind of group it together. But beyond that, um, no binning across the respiratory phases here. And so you can see you got valuable information here then from which you can do a lot more in terms of motion correction. And uh, this, uh, I like this uh, example in some cystic fibrosis subjects that were scanned in uh, Wisconsin. Um, and you kind of put this reconstruction on, on a bunch of different subjects and, and you could see the sort of range of variation of breathing patterns from shallow to deep. Some of these subjects were quite regular breathers, but other of them were you know, either uh, coughing at some point or taking deep breaths and shallow breaths, maybe were a little bit nervous, things like that. And uh, I'll give a little, um, and then the next evolution of this has been some work by, by Frank Ong, uh, who um, was at Berkeley, now at Stanford, um, where he's really just uh, pushed this idea to the extreme, in an idea he's calling extreme MRI, um, <clears throat> or actually you're using, instead of just the central case-based data, the full case-based data, but trying to reconstruct in a truly dynamic fashion. So again, as you can see in this movie, uh, you can see the various breathing patterns um, getting to uh, high resolution, and, both spatially and temporally, um, with some uh, extreme undersampling and a lot of uh, uh, very clever tricks in terms of a multi-scale low rank reconstruction, stochastic optimization. Fortunately, this is a talk is later this afternoon. Uh, he's got, uh, these are lung imaging examples. He's got some examples in DCE as well. <clears throat> um, so I think this could be very powerful in terms of, certainly in terms of the uh, managing motion uh, for pulmonary MRI. Um, so, then there's a couple type of strategies you might take after we have some estimate of the motion, whether it's from the bellows or need to go to some of these uh, data-driven approaches. Uh, you can do things like what is illustrated at the top here by these colors. We can either you know, take this uh, motion estimation. We can bin the data into different motion states. We can uh, possibly add some criteria for rejecting data as well if uh, there's some bulk motion, coughing. Um, we can, and then with that data, you can either look at reconstructing a single phase uh, with a hard or soft gating, turns out to be a very nice approach, uh, or do a, sort of an XD reconstruction uh, where you can reconstruct all the different motion states together or actually can resolve the, uh, the motion of, of the lung across the respiratory cycle. <clears throat> and then um, 
even taking that a step further, can actually do uh, to actually use all of your data instead of, so with some of these approaches, you're, you're chunking up the data in some way uh, between the motion states. <clears throat> you can do motion correction type strategies. Um, and this becomes much more SNR efficient, and we are really in a SNR uh, starved type of application. So actually with the motion correction type techniques where we do some registration between the motion states, you can actually uh, uh, improve the uh, image quality over just the motion resolved reconstructions uh, quite a bit. Check out that right after this session here. Um, and uh, again, uh, a few more examples in uh, uh, pediatrics where we found it's essential to apply this uh, motion compensation uh, and do some things like bulk motion rejection uh, and are getting nice uh, visualization of pathologies like pulmonary nodules, bronchiolitis obliterans, um, some ground glass opacities in an interstitial lung disease, uh, these uh, small cysts or pneumatocells uh, as well. And these are all in unsedated uh, children, uh, four, five, eight, and 11 years old. So quite a, quite a challenging imaging scenario. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna transition into a few of the other techniques here. Um, the, uh, there's a number of, uh, um, and some things that are, I've seen a lot of great abstracts at this meeting on are, are sort of non-UTE based, uh, but proton imaging methods. Uh, one of the first of, uh, of these introduced was an ultra-fast SSFP approach. Um, some examples of that where you're really squeezing uh, um, your, your gradients, doing a partial echo here to get a short TE, um, getting a lot of gain from actually your SSFP refocusing. And if you do this at 1.5T, you can get nice images like this without uh, banding. It's, it's a little bit harder at 3T. Um, but as I'll show in a couple, uh, in the next upcoming slides, um, one thing that, that's really uh, exciting that you can do from, from these images um, in the 2D cases, you can derive actually ventilation and perfusion maps via these techniques, Fourier de decomposition and similar techniques. Um, I should highlight there's, there's a number of uh, interesting work from the uh, group at UC San Diego um, where they do a, a similar, uh, like a 2D imaging approach. This is a very uh, relatively straightforward pulse sequence, uh, nothing modified on their scanner, uh, doing these 2D sagittal slices, but uh, doing dynamic scanning there, and uh, then uh, doing some analysis of the dynamics, uh, trying to estimate the proton uh, density with the phantom and a couple echo times, and really derive quantitative lung uh, physiology from uh, MRI, and, and you can do also ASL, uh, within this kind of a framework and, and apply oxygen enhanced imaging, which I'll also talk about in a second here. <clears throat> um, so back to this idea, one, one of the things that there's, uh, and I may have, hopefully I've got all the abstracts here, there's at least 10 at this meeting, uh, and this area is really, uh, I see a lot of growth here in these Fourier decomposition type uh, methods. Uh, we're trying to design, derive ventilation or perfusion maps, or at least ventilation or perfusion weighted imaging, um, and from uh, fast 2D dynamic scanning. Uh, so this is gonna be like a, a, a flash or gradient echo type acquisitions if uh, you're at higher field, or ultra S, uh, SSFP if you're at lower field. Uh, where you get down to resolutions, you can resolve the uh, pulmonary, uh, uh, you can freeze pulmonary motion and, uh, excuse me, uh, and resolve the dynamics. And what is done to create like these uh, ventilation weighted or perfusion weighted images is, um, is to actually register images across the uh, pulmonary and cardiac cycles. And um, this is a simulation result from, from one of the original papers there, but uh, if you simulate the, 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 you expect that the changes in the signal intensity will vary both across the respiratory cycle, so as the tissue compresses and uh, expands, that'll change our signal amplitude. So we can use that as our me measure of ventilation. And then as uh, uh, fresh uh, blood is perfusing into the lung tissue across the cardiac cycle, then you can look at these frequencies <clears throat> and uh, get uh, measurements of perfusion, all from within the same 
uh, sort of fast 2D scan. Um, so this is an example of the, uh, how this, um, uh, one of the approaches for that preful um, is done. And you're doing some image uh, registration after you get this time series of 2D images. Um, and you can binning things into the uh, respiratory and cardiac cycle, um, grabbing the images over time. Uh, and again, these are the, uh, the key to this technique is this observation well, that and uh, perfusion should change as we're, uh, uh, fresh blood from the heart is perfusing into the lung tissue, and this is happening during your cardiac cycle <clears throat> uh, due to time of flight effects. And then the ventilation amplitude, uh, the amplitude should be changing with ventilation due to this uh, compression and then expansion of the lung tissue. Um, okay, and then for the last bit here, I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, inhaled gas MRI techniques. Um, first of those is oxygen enhanced MRI. And the premise of this is that uh, uh, oxygen uh, or increased concentrations, I should say, of oxygen will shorten T1, so actually increase our signal intensities. Uh, they'll also shorten T2 star if we're using uh, UTE. This doesn't become so much of an issue. Uh, and basically, the protocols here are, uh, for doing this are, are relatively um, you know, uh, easy in that you know, breathing 100% oxygen, quite safe, quite easy to do. Um, and you can get these types of oxygen enhanced uh, signal changes that would represent uh, ventilation. And uh, so you know, if you look at quantifying, there's a the sh uh, shortening in T2 star when you're breathing 100% oxygen versus breathing uh, room air. Uh, T2 star, uh, excuse me, T1 change, T2 star change as well. Uh, so this is uh, very valuable information to utilize for ventil measures of ventilation. Um, then another uh, major area um, that uh, uh, just give you a flavor of here are the hyperpolarized noble gases. Uh, previously, it was a bit of helium-3. Now it's really mostly xenon-129 due to helium uh, shortages. And modern xenon polarizers, which use a spin exchange optical pumping, can get high polarizations. Uh, the uh, not much safety concerns. It's uh, anesthetic, so there's some uh, here's some uh, feeling of euphoria if you do these studies. Um, and it's uh, the experiment again. Here's you're breathing in this hyperpolarized gas, uh, fast imaging. There's phase three clinical trials of this technology in a clinical trial consortium uh, led out of the Cincinnati Children's Hospital group. And um, you can derive a bunch of interesting information from this. So I've talked now a little bit about ventilation. Right? We can just look at where does this gas uh, go as it's inhaled. That's your sort of basic uh, image intensity is your ventilation measurement. You're going to need to do fast imaging and account for the short T1s. Um, you can also do diffusion weighted imaging. So you have uh, uh, very high uh, ADC values um, compared to water. It's much uh, as it's a gas. Um, and this is going to give some measure of the size of the airways. Uh, so in something like emphysema, where you'd expect these to be enlarged. Uh, you could visualize that with these ADC maps. Um, and xenon also has this really cool property that it will get uh, uh, dissolved into the uh, 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 blood vessels and the red blood cells and has this huge chemical shift once it does. Um, so you can actually visualize a uh, gas phase, a so-called barrier phase, and then a phase when it gets into the red blood cells. <clears throat> and this is going to be indicative of uh, how good your lung is doing this gas exchange uh, between the air spaces and the blood. Um, and finally, the last uh, t a technique that's kind of uh, emerging in the research space here um, is the use of uh, uh, in inert fluorinated gases. Uh, so a number of uh, examples here, um, and this is, uh, has some advantages over the hyperpolarized gases in that it's very similar in that it has no background signal, you can just inhale the gas image, um, but you don't need any hyperpolarization hardware. You actually don't even need any new RF coils, uh, maybe, because the, the pro uh, fluorine has a very similar geomagnetic ratio to protons. Um, so there's some advantages here uh, over the hyperpolarized gases. Um, so to summarize here, um, you know, we have these challenges of motion, short T2 star. Um, and for doing proton imaging, we can overcome a lot of this through 
uh, either UTE and ZTE methods, uh, or even uh, get a lot of information out of just fast 2D gradient echo imaging methods here. Um, that don't require uh, sort of more custom pulse sequences or reconstructions, in fact. <coughs> um, and then you have a whole class of uh, inhaled gas imaging um, for der derivation of more functional metrics of ventilation uh, uh, and other gas exchange, the alveolar size as well. And, and there's a really great recent review here on that as well that I would point you to. Um, so summary of a few of the, the uh, there's some good software resources out there. You know, if you need image registration, we have some, uh, try to put out some code here for the reconstruction of the uh, UTE type data. And if you want to do prefull, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, Jens vogel Clausen from Hanover Medical School mentioned at the pulmonary imaging workshop that he is uh, very open to, to uh, trying to get more people to, to test out this technique as well. So I'd encourage you to reach out to him. And with that, Thank you to these people. Thank you for your attention.